and welcome back. Chapter two, section two. Today's topic, we're going to look at statistics and models. Once again, easier if you pull the PowerPoint on one side, have the video up on another so you can follow along as we go. Make sure to get your key terms. They're in the purple if you're following the PowerPoint. Hopefully they'll become a little bit obvious as we go through this as well. Here we go. Your essential question today. I want you to be able to explain the relationship between probability and risk. They're related, but not the same thing. Right off the bat, how do scientists use statistics? Well, statistics itself is just the collection and classification of data in the form of numbers. Scientists will use and rely on statistics to help summarize, characterize, analyze, or compare data. When you have a lot of different data points, it's hard to make sense of them until we start to collate them into something that can help us make sense. Statistics is actually a branch of mathematics, but it does provide scientists with important tools for understanding our data. Scientists will use statistics to describe statistical population. Statistically speaking, 90% of you are whatever. A statistical population is a group of similar things that a scientist is interested in. So we're looking at it. I would say statistically, our class average should be in the very high 70s or low 80s. Just want to look at a whole collection. If we've prepared well in an advanced class, it's what I expect. Not everybody's going to knock it out of the ballpark every time, but if my numbers are way up or way down, I have to kind of look at them and trying to figure out why. So it's just a similar thing. It can be anything. I can look at the population of bacteria in a pond. I could look at the number of people that use Crest toothpaste as opposed to every other kind of toothpaste. It can be anything, just depends on what we're actually looking at. One of the big ones is the average. And I talked about that, say, with a quiz or test data. I kind of know I'm looking for the class to get a certain sort of average, and if we're above it or below it, I gotta ask myself why. So statistical populations are composed of similar individuals. Once again, it's everybody taking Mr. Pettit's class in period one or period two, so you're all exposed to the same data, theoretically. But you're gonna have different characteristics. Some of you are gonna prepare harder, some of you are gonna study more, some of you are here at class every day, some of you are sick for a few days, what have you. So we look at the mean. Now the mean and the average really are the same thing, but the proper term is mean. I take the number of people in the class, I've got 31 people in the class, I add up all the scores and divide by 31, and bingo, I have my mean. And this provides a single numerical measure that allows for very easy comparison. So I can compare first period to second period, or fourth period to first period, what have you. Very helpful information. And then we can look at a distribution. Now, a distribution is the relative arrangement of the members in a statistical population. When we take a test, I tend to put these up in a bar graph, but if we kind of drew a curve around it, that would be a distribution. So the graph I'm putting up here is one of IQs. And if we map out enough people IQ, I take a sample population and measure their IQ, measure their IQ, this is what I tend to get. So we get this classic bell curve. So this is a normal distribution. And if we are looking at IQs in general, 100 is the statistical average. If you have a IQ of 100, congratulations, that's right on the ballpark. The people that are between 100 and 115 and 185, this is our main group of people. And it's something like, uh, almost 68% of all people fall right there. Now, if you have an IQ over 115, but only at 130, then it is one standard deviation away from normal. And if you have one above 130, then you're two standard deviations above normal. The farther we get away in these standard deviations, 
the smaller and smaller population gets. So 2% of the population out there is going to have this IQ over 130, but an IQ over 145 is only 0.1% of the population. Numbers get really, really small. And in a grading situation, I'll see something similar. Most of us will clump around this high 70s with people on both ends. This is just a normal distribution, if you will. Probabilities. This goes back into our essential question, asking what is the probability? Now, a probability is the likelihood that a possible future event, an earthquake in California, a hurricane off the coast of Florida, will occur in any given instance of the event. And we express probability with a number between zero and one. Zero, there's no probability. A earthquake that's going to make Florida fall into the sea. We're not on a fault line, so the probability is going to be 0.00, you know, a very, very small number. And one would be, it's absolutely going to happen. Now, in reality, in probabilities, we never get a zero, we never get a one. It's somewhere in between. Now, we do have to have a large enough sample size in order to obtain accurate results. If I poll four of my friends, uh, that's not an accurate result. Normally we need to, if we're talking about people, we need to get in the thousands before we're getting any kind of decent sample size. And also a lot of times in probabilities, even though it's a point, we a lot of times do it as a fraction. Four out of five dentists recommend four fifths of people. So a fraction is a pretty common way for us to actually talk about probabilities. And that takes us into risk. Risk is the probability of a unwanted outcome. Now I'm going to throw a pie chart up here, which represents the actual risk or the actual problem with oil and oil spills. Now, most people tend to worry about big oil spills or a huge oil leak. We go, oh, that's the big problem. If we could stop those big oil leaks, it's those big companies doing things that is the problem. We tend to worry about big oil spills, but there is a much greater risk of pollution from everyday sources. 51.4% of the oil out there in the environment causing problem is runoff from land. That means your car is parked in the driveway and a little bit of oil drips out, then it washes down into the drain. Cars driving along the road, little bits of oil come out. The oil coming out of the exhaust in the atmosphere, and then it rains and it settles down in. I pour some gasoline into my lawnmower and a little bit spills out. And that this is our biggest problem, 51%. Big oil spills, the splashy ones that catch the news, 5.2%. They're not the real problem. Natural seepage of oil coming, it's under the ground, right? It leaks up into the oceans is 8.8%. Just natural seepage is worse than oil spills, but we tend to worry about the risk of oil spills. So probability and risk what are they? Now, the most important risk we tend to consider is the risk of death. Oh, no, you may die by this. And people tend to overestimate the risk of dying from sensational causes like a plane crash, but underestimate the risk from common causes. As a triathlete, I do swimming in open water. So I practice in open water from time to time. I eat lakes and streams and the ocean. And when I talk about that I'll go to a lake somewhere and go for a swim, what I get all the time is, aren't you afraid you're going to get eaten by an alligator? Well, no. Seeing as only about two to three people even get killed by an alligator in a decade, it's really only about one a year at most. No, I'm not worried about that. I'm at a much greater risk of dying by driving in my car to get to the lake than I am by eaten by an alligator. But it's what I get asked all the time. Aren't you worried about this big sensational risk? My doctor would say, ooh, aren't you concerned about getting that brain-eating amoeba? And I'm like, no. Once again, you get two or three cases of that a year 
of all the people in the water sources, and there's nothing I can do about it. So no, I'm not actually concerned about it. It'd be sensational if I died by brain amoeba, because so few people do it. But the odds of it happening, the probability, almost zero. We also tend to overestimate the risk of sensational environmental problems, and we underestimate the risk of ordinary ones. We look at the red tides that happen through Florida, and we want to go, ooh, it's those big corporations or these big farms are putting out pesticides, or it's really fertilizers, and most of it's coming off of your and my lawns. It is some of the farming, but by and large, it's just normal people doing it because there's so many of us. We look at the extraordinary and we tend to underestimate the very ordinary. It's just a tendency that we do. We want to talk about models. and science, we use models all the time. These are just going to be patterns, plans, or representations designed to show either the structure or the workings of an object, a system, or a concept. And we use models all the time. You're so used to models, they'll we'll come up with the names and you'll think, what is that? But a couple of examples, you go, oh, okay, yeah, I do use that all the time. Now there's several different types of models that really help us learn about the environment that we're going to apply, that scientists in the real world and you and I will utilize them in class and you'll use them in the real world just all the time. The first one is just a physical model. These are three-dimensional models you can touch. And you may have noticed on my desk and wondered why. Well, I've got a little armadillo here. Well, this is a three-dimensional model that I can touch and look at. It looks just like the real thing. So if you've never seen an armadillo, I can answer, well, they look like this, except for they're this big or etc. Their most important feature is that they closely resemble the object or system that they are supposed to represent. Now, they may be larger or smaller. In this case, it's smaller than a regular armadillo because I'm going to model of a full-size armadillo. It'd be a little awkward. So it's smaller to get the idea. In the case of something like a bacteria, well, I'd have to make it much larger because an actual bacteria is microscopic. So something's really big, we tend to make it small. Something's really small, we tend to make it big. Now, it can be something, a model that we're projecting like yeah my shark with a freaking laser on its head because they don't normally come in. so it's a model it looks like a shark and this is how i envision the laser on its head being so it can attack people yeah but a physical model can be real can be something imagined or that we're planning but its biggest strength is it looks like the real thing or what we want the real thing to be now, sometimes some of the most useful models help teach science things something that's new or to help further other discoveries, such as DNA. The DNA model up here, this was a discovery in itself. We knew DNA was the instructions, we knew it was in our body, but what its structure was, how it was actually organized, was not until Watson and Crick came along and made the discovery and so showed the model. So the structure was based on the size and shape and the bonding qualities, which proteins bond to which other proteins in the chains, etc. And putting the pieces of the model together helped us figure out the potential structure of the DNA and help us understanding the structure help us realize how to do DNA replication and how DNA itself does replicate. Another model are graphical models. Now you use graphical models all the time. Here is a classic example. Here is a graphical model of the United States. It's a graphic, a picture model. It's not a 3D, but it's a 2D picture of a model. We use these for, maybe it's a map, it can be a schematic diagram of something, breaking down what it's going to be. And we use these all the time. We can do things to show the position of star. We can show it how much forest cover is in a particular and, you know, forest is here, forest is there. And even the depth of water in a river or along a coastline. So if we happen to be trying to look at off of the coastline, what, is, what are the different depths, where can we go? 
a graphical model is our best way to do that. And we have conceptual models. Now a conceptual model is a verbal or graphical explanation for how a system works or it's organized. Now when I coach football, we had a graphic model that we use for our linemen all the time. The guy is down on the front gonna block. It was gap down up. Now sometimes the lineman had a very specific assignment. On this play, you need to do this very specific thing. But otherwise, if the play is coming towards you, if it's going to be a running play, then you block gap down up. We just teach a player. You look, is he in your gap? If he's in your gap, you block him. If there's nobody in their gap, they're straight in front of you, well, they're not in their gap then you would go down. So there's somebody in front of me, I don't block them. There's nobody in my gap, so I don't have any of the blocks, so I block down. I'm gonna block that guy. If there's nobody in my gap, there's nobody down, because he's in the next person's gap, then I block up. I go up a level and I block a linebacker or somebody else. A conceptual model. So when I get down, I go, this is what I do. It's a flow chart of what to do. If this, then that have a flow chart up here, and a lot of times we'll use these by little boxes, etc., to show what we do in the situation. So I look at my lamp. Now I know this is very simple. We don't need a flow chart for it, but it's what we do. I look at the lamp. It doesn't work. Well, is it plugged in? No, it's not plugged in. Plug it in and the lamp works. It's plugged in, but it's still not working. Is the bulb burned out? I check the bulb, uh, the bulb's burned out. I replace the bulb and it works. If it's not plugged in, if the bulb is good, now I have to quote unquote repair the lamp. Now I have to go into a more complex conceptual model or flow chart. But we use these all the time. It helps us better understand in this situation, I do this, then I would do this, then I would do this, but they're pretty common. They also can just be verbal descriptions. Once again, the gap down up, or it can be the drawing like we looked at. Now, also a conceptual model is the structure of the atom. We talk about understanding the atom. In the center is the nucleus. The nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons surrounded by a electron shell. And we show it up and this is a conceptual model. We believe this is how it works or orients. And this helps illustrate another point. A model can be more than one type. An atomic model might be made of using plastic balls and yarn or something, and it could be both conceptual, we think this is the concept of what it looks like, and a physical model. So it is possible for something to be more than one. And lastly, we'll talk about mathematical models. Now, math teachers sometimes laugh at me or you go in, because you realize math isn't real, right? It's a model. I say, give me two. You can't give me two. You say, yeah, I can too. Oh, that's two fingers. Or you can hand me two models. Or you can hand me two dollars. But you can't give me a two. A two doesn't exist, if you will. And if I say, well, if you give me $10 and she gives me $10, how much money will I have? I would have 20, but I don't have $20 because if they don't, it's a model, but it's a very good model because as long as we put the right data in, if you gave me 10 and if she gave me 10, I would have $20. And I think, ooh, what could I do with $20? But it's just an equation that represents a way a system or process works. So I can balance my checkbook. I got, this, I got paid this much money. I've spent this much money. How much money do I have left over? I don't see my actual money because it's somewhere else. Math allows me to know what I can do. It, doesn't, it represents my real money, which is somewhere else. And they're very important when we look at cases that have a lot of variables, such as the weather, all the things affecting the weather. We're trying to plot where is the hurricane going to go, or where is it? We got to plot in all these different points of data, high systems, low pressure systems, moisture in the air, temperature, to try and get an idea of what will more than likely happen. Although mathematical models use numbers and equations, they're not always right. 
and the people that interpret the data and write the equations because once again, people are the ones doing it. If I don't put the right numbers in, I'm not going to get the right numbers out. I'm balancing my equation and I forgot that I paid for my electric bill, which was some $238. And I think I have more money than I did because I made a error or a mistake. Our mathematical models are only as good as the data, the numbers we put into them. If my equation is wrong, I leave out a step, my conclusion will be wrong. If my data is wrong, I put in a wrong number, my conclusion will be wrong. So math is only as good as the numbers that we actually put into it. Just like the uh, little one here where little Johnny's looking at him and says, oh, just a darn minute. Yesterday you said X was equal to two. <laughs> Today it's equal to three, a different thing in an equation. So these are our models that will wrap it up today for section two, statistics and models. Take care and we'll see you next time when we look at section three.